Hi, I'm Osamu Sakai from Boston Medical Center, Boston University. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to moderate this session with Dr. Candy from University of Wisconsin Medicine. Our first lecture will be given by Dr. Joshua Lantos, Assistant Professor of Radiology at Cornell Medical College. His topic for today is orbital anatomy. Hi, everybody. My name is Josh Lantos, and I'm going to be discussing orbital anatomy uh, from my home here in uh, New York City. Um, thank you all for uh, attending the uh, lecture uh, virtually, and I hope everyone's healthy and safe. So, unfortunately, this talk is not about my favorite type of ice cream cone, um, which we can see here. Some people have analogized the bony orbit to the uh, sort of the waffle cone, um, and then the globe is kind of that ice cream scoop on top. I, I like this analogy. I'm just not sure uh, what the sprinkles represent here, maybe a preceptal cellulitis or something like that. Anyway, moving on to my second favorite type of cone, uh, we'll be talking today about the orbits from the outside to the inside. So we'll look at the bony outside structures, then the fibrous support structures, then the muscles, uh, the extraocular muscles, uh, the globe, the arteries and veins, and then we'll finally end with the lacrimal apparatus. Here's uh, an article I'd like to commend to all of you. Uh, it's just out in AJNR this past July. And these authors used uh, a dedicated coil for the eye over here, um, which helps uh, generate a much better spatial resolution as they show here with their satural T1 weighted images. This is the whole brain. And this is using their dedicated eye coil where you can see the lens replacement quite nicely. And obviously the spatial resolution here looks a lot nicer. Um, and I will be borrowing some uh, images from this article. Uh, so let's move to the bony orbits. Uh, there are seven bones that contribute to the bony orbit. So the uh, bony anatomy is a little bit complex and we'll go through each of the walls of the orbit. Uh, but essentially it's the these seven bones, the frontal, ethmoid, maxillary, lacrimal, zygomatic, sphenoid, and palatine bones that make up the orbit. The orbital roof uh, only has two bones. It's the sphenoid bone posteriorly, and it's the frontal bone here anteriorly. The medial wall is made up of four different bones, so it's the lesser wing of the sphenoid here posteriorly. Come a little bit further up, and we have the ethmoid bone also called the lamina papyracea here because it's so thin, and you can see on these 3D reconstructed images we can essentially see right through the bone. Uh, a little bit more anteriorly, we have the lacrimal bone, and then we finally have the frontal process of the maxilla right here. The orbital floor going from posterior to anterior is the uh, orbital process of the palatine bone the orbital process of the maxilla, and then the orbital process of the zygomatic bone. And finally, the lateral wall is primarily made up uh, of the greater wing of the sphenoid. Anteriorly, we have the zygomatic bone, and then the uh, frontal bone comes over and forms a little bit of the lateral wall as well. Some important foramina that we care about in the bony orbit. Uh, first, we'll start with the optic canal, which of course transmits uh, cranial nerve 2 and the ophthalmic artery. Uh, the entire wall of the optic canal is made up of the uh, lesser wing of the sphenoid. So here's our optic canal here. This is called the optic strut, which is the lateral aspect of the lesser wing of the sphenoid, and that separates the optic canal from the larger, more lateral, superior orbital fissure. Here on a 3D reconstructed image, we're looking down the optic canal here, and we can see the optic strut here just laterally. And this entire wall is made up of the lesser wing of the sphenoid. 
Here's the superior orbital fissure, so now we're just going to go lateral to the optic strut. We have this large area transmitting cranial nerves 3, 4, uh, V1, uh, the abducens nerve, and the superior ophthalmic vein. Um, and we can see here the lateral wall is the lesser wing of the sphenoid and the optic strut, uh, and the lateral wall here is the greater wing of the sphenoid. So again here, optic canal, optic strut, so that's our most lateral aspect of the lesser wing of the sphenoid and the medial wall of the superior orbital fissure. And here we have the greater wing of the sphenoid making up the lateral border of the superior orbital fissure. The inferior orbital fissure uh, generally communicates with the superior orbital fissure. Uh, there's not really a, uh, a uh, there, there's no uh, bony uh, discontinuity here. Um, these inferior orbital fissure uh, usually uh, contains, uh, sometimes contains the inferior ophthalmic vein, and it does contain uh, V2 uh, as it's the anterior continuation of foramen rotundum. And here we can see it's formed by the greater wing of the sphenoid, the zygomatic bone, and then medially it's the maxillary and ethmoid bones. So we'll move on from the bony orbit to uh, some fibrous support structures. Uh, we'll first talk about the periorbita, which is the most outermost uh, soft tissue component of the orbit. Um, and this is dense connective tissue that covers the inner bony orbit and it's continuous anteriorly with the periosteum of the facial bones and posteriorly it's contiguous with uh, dura. The muscles, tendons, and ligaments attach to the periorbita and um, specifically the, uh, an important part of the periorbita is the annulus of Zinn which is this uh, thickening of the periorbita posteriorly. So let's talk about the annulus. The annulus is a tendinous ring formed by the thickened periorbit at the apex. It's tendinous because the extraocular muscles originate from the annulus. Um, the, all four rectus muscles, the superior oblique and the levator palpebrae, all arise from the annulus. The only one that does not is the inferior oblique, which originates from the floor of the orbit. The annulus encompasses the entire optic canal, so that's the optic nerve and the ophthalmic artery, and then a portion of the superior orbital fissure is also encompassed by the annulus, and that's the part that contains cranial nerve 3, uh, 6, and the nasociliary branch of V1. So the extraocular muscles arise from the annulus and generally insert on the globe with the exception of the levator palpebrae. Um, and we all know the uh, most of the extraocular muscles are innervated by cranial nerve 3 uh, with the exception of the superior oblique innervated by 4 and the lateral rectus innervated by 6. The levator palpebrae is the only one that does not insert on the globe. Uh, the job of the levator palpebrae is to elevate the upper lid, um, and it comes here anteriorly uh, and has basically two insertions. So the more anterior is as the levator aponeurosis, and that inserts on the upper lid. And then deep to that is the Mueller muscle and the Mueller muscle inserts on the tarsal plate. This dense connective tissue uh, that helps add rigidity to the lids, and it contains uh, these uh, sebaceous or mimobian glands that have T1 hyperintense secretions, which makes it very easy to identify the tarsal plate on the high-resolution T1-weighted images. Um, and uh, in addition to being a site of attachment for the Mueller muscle, it's also an attachment site for the orbital septum. Another slide here on the tarsal plate, so we can see it's this dense connective tissue uh, that adds rigidity to the lids. Medially, it's anchored by the medial canthal tendon and laterally by the lateral canthal tendon, which inserts on Wittenhall's tubercle.
the orbital septum we care about, of course, because we uh, want to always be on the lookout for disease processes that can pass by the septum. If we have a cellulitis that goes post-septal, we know our patients need IV antibiotics. If we have um, a malignancy that's crossing the septum, we're going to be concerned that it's uh, more aggressive. So uh, here's our fibrous septum. You can see it on these high-resolution T1-weighted images. It comes down from the uh, orbital roof and inserts here on the levator aponeurosis. Um, and it separates the orbit from the uh, lid structures. And again, we care about that because once we go post-septal, uh, diseases can, can progress uh, and be more significant clinically. Often we have to infer where the septum is on uh, conventional MR and CT images, but uh, we can actually see it here on these high-resolution images. So we'll move on to the tenon capsule. That's this uh, fibrous connective tissue here that surrounds the sclera. It's uh, separated from the episclera by this potential space that allows for ocular motility. Um, and the tenon capsule separates the globe from retrobulbar fat. Uh, the extraocular muscles actually have to penetrate the tenon capsule to insert on the sclera. The sclera is also a hypo-intense fibrous uh, outer layer um, of the globe. It's just deep to the tenon capsule. It's contiguous with the dura of the optic sheath. Um, it is the site for attachment of the extraocular muscles, and uh, it serves to maintain intraocular pressure and protect the globe. The retina is where our photoreceptor cells lie, um, and there's also bipolar and ganglion cells which transmit uh, photoreceptor cell uh, input uh, back towards the optic nerve. Um, centrally, we of course have the macula for daylight and color vision. That's where our cones are. Peripherally, we have the rods. Um, the anterior margin of the retina, which is around out here, and over here is called the aura serrata. The middle layer of the globe in between the retina, which is the inner layer, and the sclera, which is the outer layer. And it's a pigmented tract, um, so it's T1 hyperintense, making it easy to identify in these high-resolution T1-weighted images. Uh, the largest part of the uveal tract is the choroid, and uh, it's this T1 hyperintense layer back here, and it's the vascular supply for the photoreceptor cells. More anteriorly along the uveal tract, we have the T1 hyperintense iris, which is this thin elastic T1 hyperintense tissue that overlaps the lens, and the sphincter muscle uh, provides the pupillary response. The iris also divides the uh, anterior chamber and posterior chamber uh, compartments which communicate through the pupil. And then this uh, more posterior part of the uveal tract is the ciliary body and that's attached to the lens via the zonule fibers and the contraction of the ciliary body is what provides a lens accommodation and the ciliary body is also a source of aqueous production. If we magnify here on these structures, um, this is again from our, from our paper uh, out this last July, uh, we can see here we have the hypotense sclera that eventually becomes uh, the cornea when it becomes hypotense. We have the ciliary body here, which is a little bit thicker part of the uveal tract, and that is attached to the lens by these uh, zonule fibers or the zonules of zin. Here's our iris, uh, a little bit more, uh, a little bit thinner than the ciliary body, and dividing the posterior chamber from the anterior chamber. Here's our lens, and they made a nice uh, drawing here because even with these nice uh, high-resolution images, it's hard to see the zonules. But this is uh, essentially how they um, insert on the uh, lens here from the ciliary body. Again, here's our iris dividing the posterior chamber from the anterior chamber. Sclera ends where the cornea begins.
We'll talk now about the ophthalmic artery. So this is the first intradural branch of the internal carotid artery, typically. Um, it starts out in the inferolateral optic canal and uh, extends inferolateral to the optic nerve at the apex. And then it crosses over the optic nerve as its second segment. And the central retinal artery usually originates at this uh, first and segment second uh, segment junction, and then in the third segment, it courses here medially within the optic canal. So here's coronal uh, reconstructions of an MRA image showing the first segment inferior and sometimes lateral, crossing over the optic nerve here and then running superior medial to the optic uh, to the optic nerve. And in the axial plane, we can see here it's inferolateral, crosses over the nerve here. This is the second segment. And then the third segment is here running medially. There is, of course, variant anatomy with the ophthalmic artery. About 1 to 2 percent originate from the middle meningeal artery. So if we look here, we can see uh, this is uh, foramen spinosa, the middle meningeal artery here, comes over, runs along the floor of the middle cranial fossa, and in this case, uh, gives off a branch to become the ophthalmic artery, and this is the same uh, same uh, artery in uh, coronal images coming up from the skull base. Uh, less likely, or less commonly, the uh, ophthalmic artery can originate from the cavernous internal carotid artery, in which case it would be an extradural origin. And of course, if we had an aneurysm here at the origin, it would be an extradural aneurysm. The ophthalmic veins uh, is our next topic here. So the, the superior ophthalmic vein is formed by the confluence of the angular vein, which runs up from the face, so that's over here, and the supraorbital vein, which comes down from the scalp. Those come together here in the anteromedial orbit and form the superior ophthalmic vein, which then runs back posteriorly within the orbit. Um, it crosses over the optic nerve um, and then runs laterally within the orbit. So here it is in the coronal plane, it's superior medial. Now it's going to cross over the optic nerve and then run a little bit laterally until it gets to the superior orbital fissure and then drains into the cavernous sinus. The inferior ophthalmic vein is typically associated with the inferior rectus. Um, here we can see the vein is just lateral to the inferior rectus. And uh, there's some variable anatomy here, a cananastomos with the superior ophthalmic vein, and then drain back to the cavernous sinus uh, through the superior orbital fissure, uh, which is the more typical anatomy, but it can also drain into the cavernous sinus directly, or it can drain uh, through the inferior orbital fissure into pterygoid venous plexus. And finally, we have the lacrimal apparatus. So uh, the lacrimal gland is divided into the orbital lobe and the palpebral lobe by the levator aponeurosis. The orbital lobe is this larger and more uh, lateral superior portion of the gland. The drainage is, uh, so the ducts of the gland drain into the, uh, over in, into the globe here laterally, and then tears move here medially to the medial puncta, and then they go into the upper and lower uh, canaliculi, and then drain into a common canaliculus, and then they go into the lacrimal sac, and eventually down into the nasolacrimal duct and the inferior turbinate. So uh, a lesion anywhere across, anywhere along this course uh, could potentially cause epiphora. So even if you had a middle meatus lesion, you would get a backup of uh, lacrimal gland secretions and epiphora. So we uh, made it to the end here. Um, as I said, we did not discuss my favorite type of cone, uh, but we did examine the orbit from the outside to the inside. Uh, we looked at the bony structures, the fibrous support structures, the muscles, 
the globe, the arteries and vein, and the lacrimal apparatus. Uh, I do have some citations here for some of the images I used. And with that, I thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Lantos. Excellent talk on work done at me. Our next lecture will be given by Dr. Rupa Radha Krishnan, Assistant Professor of Radiology and Imaging Sciences, Indiana University. She's a pediatric neuroradiologist at Riley Hospital for Children. Her topic for today is congenital lesions of the orbits. Hello, my name is Rupa Radha Krishnan, and I am going to be talking about congenital lesions of the orbit. I thank Dr. Schmalthus and the organizing committee of ASHNR 2020 for the invitation. I have no relevant disclosures, and I will be talking about congenital and early developmental abnormalities of the periorbital tissues, the orbit, and the globe. Development of the orbit and globe is closely associated with development of other facial structures and therefore abnormalities of the globes and orbits are frequently associated with other abnormalities of the face and intracranial structures. To start with, here is a three-week-old who presented with left eye redness and swelling. You can see that there are two cystic structures along the medial aspects of both orbits. These structures are tubular and extend intranasally with expansion of the inferior meatus. And this is nasal lacrimal duct mucosal. Nasal lacrimal duct mucosals occur because of congenital obstruction of the nasal lacrimal duct at the level of valve of Hassner, which is where the lacrimal duct enters the inferior meatus. They may be associated with complications such as dacrocystitis as a result of enlargement and inflammation of the lacrimal sac. They may resolve spontaneously or with conservative measures, however, probing typically causes rapid improvement. Here is another infant who presented with a periorbital bluish mass along the medial aspect of the right orbit. This was present since birth. This mass is bilobed with an intranasal component, and this mass does not restrict diffusion. On the coronal images, you can see that the intranasal component is somewhat tubular and extending craniad. On the CT, it is impossible to distinguish whether there is true intracranial extension or not, because the floor of the anterior cranial fossa is not yet ossified. However, on MRI, you can see that there is no true intracranial extension. There is, however, dysplastic appearance of the inferior right frontal lobe. This lesion is a nasal glial heterotopia. Nasal glial heterotopias, also called nasal gliomas, have a similar embryologic pathogenesis to the frontoethmoid cephalocele and the nasal dermoids, and they occur because of failure of regression of the dural glial projection into the nasofrontal region in the embryonic period. They are characteristically midline in location, although paramedian locations have also been described. Dermoids are the most common lesion occurring in and around the orbits in children. They are typically hyperintense on T2 weighted imaging, do not have internal enhancement, and they may cause smooth bony remodeling with intracranial extension. Typically, they have diffusion restriction. Dermoids occur because of the embryonic ectoderm being trapped during neural tube closure. Most commonly, they occur along the lateral aspect of the orbit and may also be seen along the inner aspect of the orbit. Now moving to abnormalities of interocular distance. As we saw previously, development of the globes and orbits is closely related to development of the craniofacial structures and forebrain development, and therefore abnormalities of interocular distance are only rarely isolated abnormalities. Hyperartillerism, which has increased interocular distance, frequently has a syndromic association, although these are typically non-chromosomal syndromes. Frontonasal dysplasia and craniosynostosis, such as Ebert syndrome, are common lesions that can be seen in the setting of hyperartillerism. 
Hypotelorism, on the other hand, which is decreased interocular distance, can be seen with chromosomal abnormalities such as trisomy 13. Holoprosencephaly and craniosynostosis are malformations that can be seen with hypotelorism. Here is a 12-month-old with hypertelorism who has a intracranial midline abnormality, namely the sphenoethmoid cephalocele, as well as a genesis of the corpus callosum. This is a three-month-old with a Burt syndrome who has hypertelorism along with brachycephaly or anteroposterior flattening of the calvary. There is synostosis of the coronal sutures as indicated by the red arrows and widening of the metopic and sagittal sutures as indicated by the blue arrows. Children with Apert syndrome characteristically have syndactyly or fusion of the digits as seen on the hand x-ray. This 11-day-old with hypotelorism has the characteristic intracranial findings of alobarholoprosencephaly, where there is failure of cleavage of the cerebral hemispheres with um, the brain parenchyma in a plate-like or pancake-like fashion distributed anteriorly with a large posterior monoventricle. This 53-day-old with hypotelorism has metopic synostosis characterized by early sutural fusion of the midline metopic suture, which is also ridged in this case, and has the characteristic triangle appearance of the calvarium, also called trigonocephaly. The globes may also be abnormally positioned and protuberant as seen on this fetal MRI in this 29-week um, gestation fetus. And this type of protuberant appearance of the globes is not true proptosis, but rather due to the presence of shallow orbits seen in the setting of mid-phase hypoplasia. This fetus also has hypertelorism, severe micrognathia, and microtia, all of which can be seen in the setting of treacher Collins syndrome and related abnormalities. Now moving on to intraorbital masses that can be congenital or developmental. This is a one month old male who presented with a one week history of proptosis and you can see an intraconal mass that is hyperintense on T2 weighted images with marked enhancement internal flow voids and bright ADC signal. This is characteristic of an infantile hemangioma, which is the most common benign solid orbital tumor in infants. These are GLUT1 positive with early rapid proliferation that is typically seen in infancy that may result in visual complications when they occur in and around the eye. They typically have a good response to propranolol therapy. One of the important mimics of infantile hemangioma is rhabdobiosarcoma, which can also occur in and around the orbit. These may be slightly more heterogeneous than the infantile hemangiomas on T2 weighted imaging and characteristically are dark on ADC maps because they are the small round blue cell hypercellular tumors. Here is another vascular abnormality that can be seen within the orbit. This is a five-year-old who presented with proptosis. There is a lobulated intraconal lesion in the right orbit with fluid fluid levels. There is no diffusion restriction and there is very minimal marginal enhancement following contrast. This is very characteristic of a low flow vascular malformation such as a lymphatic malformation. Orbital teratomas are congenital tumors that have been rarely described. They typically are heterogeneous with fat components and um, calcification as well as soft tissue components. In this one day old with a congenital right orbital um, teratoma, there is also dysplastic appearance of the right uh, globe. Now moving on to disorders of the globe. Complete absence of ocular tissue is anophthalmia, while a small appearance of the globe is microphthalmia. 
Primary anophthalmia occurs because of an early insult to the developing embryo within the first two weeks of life so that no optic vesicle can be formed. Consecutive anophthalmia occurs because of a degeneration of the previously formed optic vesicle and they may resemble microphthalmia later in life. Both anophthalmia and microphthalmia may be unilateral or bilateral and can be idiopathic or may be associated with genetic abnormalities. They can also occur because of in utero torch infections. Here is an example of an infant with left microphthalmia. The left orbit is small and there is minimal fibrous tissue enhancing in the left orbit. The left optic nerve is also absent. Here is a 13 month old with right microphthalmia. This infant also has other abnormalities that are associated. There is a midline central incisor, a genesis of the corpus callosum, as well as a sphenoidmoid cephalocele, which would be most consistent with um, the Sakota complex. Walker Warburg syndrome is another condition that can be associated with microphthalmia. This is a muscular dystrophy with the typical intracranial abnormalities characterized by cobblestone lysencephaly and the Z-shaped brainstem. Now, enlargement of the globe is called macrophthalmia, and it may be a diffuse enlargement of the globe involving both the anterior and the posterior segments, such as um, with congenital or infantile glaucoma connective tissue disorders, or hypertrophy syndrome such as Proteus syndrome. Enlargement of the globe in the AP dimension alone, which only involves the posterior segment, can be seen with axial myopia, which can also occur in the early neonatal period. Here is an infant with dysplastic appearance of both globes with fissuring along the inframedial and posterior aspect of the globes these is described with coloboma, which is a congenital defect in the layer of um, any layer of the eye and can occur because of absence of closure of the embryonic choroid fissures. They may be bilateral in about half the cases and are frequently associated with other intracranial or systemic malformations. Staphyloma, which should be differentiated from a coloboma, occurs because of thinning of a globe layer, which is an acquired condition. Here is a um, picture of the embryonic choroid fissure, which is present along the inframedial aspect of the optic cup and the optic stock through which the hyaloid artery enters. Facey syndrome is a condition which can be associated with colobomas of the globes and they typically have posterior fossa or cerebellar malformations, large hemangiomas of the head and neck, arterial abnormalities typically involving the carotid system, cardiac anomalies, as well as sternal clefts. Here is a seven-year-old who has bilateral colobomas as well as dysplasia of the inner ears with absence of all three semicircular canals. This is very characteristic of the charge syndrome. It should be noted that not all children present with all manifestations of charge, which include colobomas, cardiac defects, coronal atresia, growth and gentle retardation, and ear anomalies. Here is another 14-month-old with CHARGE syndrome who has a small dysplastic microphthalmic globe as indicated by the red arrow, but there are also large cysts within the orbit. These are colobomatous cysts which occur in the presence of microphthalmia and these occur because of failure of the choroid fissure to close with herniation of the dysplastic neuroectodermal tissue through the choroid fissure. The colobomatous cyst may or may not communicate it with the globe, and the globes, um, as in this case, are typically microphthalmic. Both colobomas and colobomatous um, 
sepsis can be associated with several intracranial and systemic conditions, one of them being the oculocerebrocutaneous syndrome or Delman syndrome, where there are characteristic skin appendages. Brain malformations include a genesis of the corpus callosum, polymicrogyria, giant dysplastic tectum with cerebellar vermin hypoplasia, and postgeophosa fluid collections. This infant also had an atritic parietal cephalocele. Hypoplasia of the optic nerves may be an isolated abnormality or can be seen with other abnormalities such as in the, with the absence of the leaflets of the septum pellucidum and abnormalities of the pituitary gland, as in this case ectopic posterior pituitary T1 bright spot as described with septa optic dysplasia. Only one third of um, patients have the complete phenotype and two-thirds of them may have hypopituitarism even if there is a normal pituitary on imaging appearance. The HES-X1, OTX2, and SOX2 genes have recently been described as contributing to a small group of the septa optic dysplasia. Cortical malformations such as hydrocephaly and polymicrogyria may also be seen in this disorder. Now, moving on to intraocular abnormalities that can present with leukocoria, which is absence of the red reflex. Persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous is the second most common cause of leukocoria in infants, and it occurs because of failure of the embryologic hyaloid vascular system to regress normally and can present with this martini glass appearance of um, abnormality extending from the posterior aspect of the lens to the optic disc. These are usually unilateral abnormalities and seen in term infants. Here is another neonate who presents with leukocoria and a large posterior globe mass that shows enhancement, restricts diffusion, and has susceptibility artifacts suggestive of calcification or microhemorrhage. And this is most consistent with a neonatal retinoblastoma. Retinoblastomas are the most common cause of leukocoria in infants. Approximately 10% of retinoblastomas are diagnosed in neonates and are believed to occur in the embryonic or fetal period. These occur because of germline mutations in the retinoblastoma gene or RB1 gene. Here is a differential diagnosis for a retinal mass that can be seen in an infant. This was a 21-month-old male who presented with a mass lesion overlying the optic disc. There is no enhancement of this lesion. However, this lesion does restrict diffusion. This lesion was stable over a three-month period, and this is a combined retinal hematoma. Combined retinal hematoma, or combined hematoma of the retina and retinal pigment epithelium, is a rare benign lesion that can occur along the macula, the juxtapapillary location, or in the periphery, and they contain glial cells, vascular tissue, and sheets of pigment epithelial cells. Fluorescent angio angiography is diagnostic of this condition. Unfortunately, on MRI, it may be hard to distinguish between retinal hematomas and retinoblastomas. Retinal hematomas may, can also occur in the setting of tuberous sclerosis complex, as can be seen in this three-month-old with a small enhancing nodule in the left globe. There is abnormality with narrowing of the distal internal carotid arteries bilaterally, as well as persistence of the embryonic infundibular recess of the third ventricle all of which can be seen with morning glory disc anomaly. So in summary, we have reviewed some of the congenital and early developmental lesions of the globe and orbit. And we have seen that these congenital globe and orbital lesions often are associated with intracranial or systemic abnormalities. Thank you very much for listening to this talk. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you very much, Dr. Rana Christian. Our next lecture will be given by Dr. Bigas Jane, Associate Professor of Radiology.
Case Western Reserve University from Metal Health Hospital, Cleveland, Ohio. His topic for today is orbital masses, differential diagnosis based on age and imaging appearance. I would like to thank the program committee for the invitation. Today I will talk about orbital masses, differential diagnosis based on age and imaging appearance, no disclosures. I will talk about mass lesions involving the orbit, describe the morphological features, and I will talk about how to use location, age, and morphological features for appropriate differential diagnosis. I look at the age of the patient. Then I uh, des describe the mass according to the location, whether it is intraconal, conal, extraconal, or multi-compartmental. Then I describe the imaging appearance to reach at a narrow differential diagnosis, and I will show you many cases. These are the common pediatric orbital mass lesions according to the compartments. And here are the adult orbital mass lesions. We will talk about these mass lesions. To start with optic nerve glioma, this is the most common optic nerve tumor. It can be sporadic or it can be because of neurofibromatosis type 1. When we look at the optic nerve glioma, we should describe the extent, whether it is extending to the orbital apex and some of these tumors will extend posteriorly to involve the chiasma and hypothalamus. These mass lesions are usually iso-intense on T1 and iso-intense to hyper-intense on T2. Contrast enhancement is variable. In this particular case, this mass is showing intense homogeneous contrast enhancement. Calcification is very rare in these mass lesions. Optic nerve dioma arises from the optic nerve. Therefore, you will not see the optic nerve separate from the mass. But in other intraconal mass lesions such as hemangiomas, you will see the mass separate from the optic nerve. Optic nerve glioma, when arises as sporadic, it will present as a fusiform mass lesion. But when it is a part of neurofibromatosis type 1, there is diffuse enlargement of the optic nerves and the optic nerves will be tortuous, kinked or buckled. It can be unilateral or bilateral. But if we see bilateral optic nerve gliomas, then it is pathognomonic for NF1. Here we see a mass which is involving both optic nerves and this is involving the chiasma. Optic nerve sheet meningioma presents as thickening and enhancement of the optic nerve sheet. It spares the optic nerve itself. Therefore, on coronal images, it will appear as a donut appearance when there is thickening and enhancement of the soft tissue. More anteriorly, the mass is very big and we can see this appearance. On T2 weighted images, it is usually low signal intensity because of dense cellularity. It is commonly seen in fifth decade and more common in females. <coughs> Calcification is seen in approximately 20 to 50 percent of the patients. On axial and sagittal images, we can see the tram track enhancement tram track pattern because the optic nerve itself is normal and there is thickening and enhancement of the optic nerve sheet. When we describe the optic nerve sheet meningioma, we should look at the extension posteriorly into the intracanalicular portion and intracranial portion. Some of these tumors are primary, some are secondary. That means there could be a meningioma arising from the brain and it can secondarily extend into the orbit. And we should see if the tumor is extending into the chiasma. Very rarely, <coughs> excuse me, after arising in the chiasma, it can extend to the contralateral optic nerve. There are some differential diagnoses. Sometimes, thickening and enhancement of the optic nerve sheet can also be seen with neurosarcoidosis or pseudotumor or lymphoma. In this case, we are seeing diffuse thickening of the dura and there are multiple small mass lesions based on dura. And after treatment with steroids after a few weeks, this mass significantly decreased in size. Cavernous malformation, also known as hemangioma, is the most common benign mass in adults. It is commonly seen in females between 2nd through 4th decade. It is a low flow venous malformation. It is not a tumor. It is seen in intraconal space, more commonly in the lateral aspect of the intraconal space. It is well circumscribed, homogeneous or wide mass, and it is very hyper intense on T2 weighted images. Flaboliths are very rare, but if present, can be very helpful to make a diagnosis. These mass lesions, they grow slowly and they can cause bony remodeling they do not cause any bony destruction or erosion. Here we can see bony remodeling because of slow growth of this <coughs> mass lesion. And they displace the surrounding structures. 
Here we can see it is displacing the optic nerve on the lateral aspect. Cavernous malformation is iso-intense on T1. It is homogeneously hyper-intense on T2. Contrast enhancement on the early arterial phase is poor because of scant arterial supply. Delayed venous phase shows progressive filling from periphery to center with complete filling within 30 minutes. In this particular case, an angiogram was performed and we can see there is absence of early arterial phase filling. Hemangiopericytomas are rare mass lesions. They are seen in fifth decade. These mass lesions can be bland to frankly malignant with metastasis seen in approximately 15% of the patients. <coughs> These are highly vascular tumors. Majority of them are seen in the extra corner space adjacent to the paranasal sinuses. These tumors will have infiltrative margins and they can cause bony destruction. Capillary hemangiomas are also called benign hemangioendothelioma. They are the most common orbital vascular tumors in infants. They usually appear shortly after birth. They will rapidly increase in size for 6 to 12 months and then gradually involute over the next 5 to 7 years. They are predominantly extraconal. They have lobulated and irregular margins. Now, cavernous malformations which are seen in adults, they do not show early arterial phase filling and they will show delayed venous filling and slowly progressive filling. While capillary hemangiomas which are seen in infants and hemangiopericytomas which can be seen at any age, they will show intense contrast enhancement on the early arterial phase. Peripheral nerve sheets tumors such as schwannoma, they are usually extraconal. However, some of them can be intraconal also. They are well encapsulated, benign, slowly growing tumors, seen from 20 to 70 year age group. They are heterogeneous on T2 weighted images and they show heterogeneous contrast enhancement. They are slowly growing mass lesions, therefore they can also cause remodeling <coughs> and they can cause expansion of the superior orbital fissure and they can extend posteriorly into the cranial cavity. Plexiform neurofibroma is pathognomonic for neurofibromatosis type 1. It is a serpentine mass, looks like bag of worms and it can extend into the face and the scalp tissue. It insinuates between the tissue planes. It is hyper intense on T2 and shows contrast enhancement. Other findings of neurofibromatosis 1 are also seen such as <laughs> sphenoid wing dysplasia, bophthalmos, there may be optic nerve gliomas and other, other features of NF1. Rhabdomyosarcoma is the most common malignant mesenchymal tumor of childhood. Orbit is the most common location in head and neck and approximately 40% of head and neck rhabdomyosarcomas are seen in the orbits, commonly seen between 5 to 10 years. They are usually extraconal mass lesions, but they can be intraconal and they can be multi-compartmental. They may be hypo to hyper intense on T2. This mass is iso intense on T2 with some cystic areas and necrosis. It is predominantly intraconal with some extraconal component. <coughs> it is causing proptosis. This mass shows restricted diffusion which is uh, hyper intense on B1000 images and it shows low signal intensity on ADC maps. There is heterogeneous contrast enhancement on the post contrast images. Sometimes they can cause rapid proptosis. Main differential diagnoses are capillary hemangiomas, histiocytosis, neuroblastoma metastasis and lymphoma. Venolymphatic malformations are usually extraconal, but they can be multi-compartmental or intraconal. They are predominantly seen in pediatric patients and majority of cases are diagnosed before the age of 20 years. These lesions are hyperintense on T2. Here we see a mass which is hyperintense on T2. It is multi-compartmental and we can see fluid levels. We see these multiple fluid levels and there is no enhancement on the post-contrast images. So if we see a mass which is cystic with fluid levels without any enhancement, we should think about phenolymphatic malformation. Lymphoproliferative lesions are the most common mass lesions after the age of 60. They have a spectrum of lymphoid hyperplasia, atypical lymphoid hyperplasia to lymphoma. They are homogeneous. They have low signal intensity on T2 because of dense cellularity and high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. Usually they show intense homogeneous contrast enhancement. Lymphoma can be primary or systemic. MALT subtype of lymphoma, which is a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, is the most common primary orbital lymphoma. Pain is usually absent. 
Here we see a mass which is low signal intensity on T2 in the inferior aspect of right orbit. It is hypointense on T1, hypermetabolic on PET, homogeneous contrast enhancement, low signal intensity on ADC, and it shows hyperintense signal intensity on B1000 images, suggestive of restricted diffusion. Another case of lymphoma, this was mental cell lymphoma. Majority of lymphoma in the orbits are unilateral but approximately 24% of them can be bilateral. Lacrimal glands are involved in approximately 40% of these cases <coughs> and lymphoma can be diffuse or ill-defined. Lymphoma molds to the orbital structures. Here we see bilateral smooth homogeneous enlargement of bilateral lacrimal glands. Bilateral lacrimal glands are enlarged. In this case, there is asymmetrical enlargement of the right lacrimal gland and there is some infiltrative soft tissue mass in the retrobulbar space. Both are cases of lymphoma. 5 to 14 percent of orbital mass lesions involve the lacrimal glands. 50 percent of them can be malignant. It can be because of a benign tumor or malignant tumor or inflammatory processes like sarcoidosis, Sjogren's and pseudotumor. Most common benign tumor is pleomorphic adenoma. Most common malignant tumor is adenoid cystic carcinoma. Adenoid cystic carcinoma has high propensity for perineural tumor spread. So we should look for perineural tumor spread if there is a lacrimal gland mass. Lymphoma also commonly involves the lacrimal gland. Here we see a mass which is heterogeneously enhancing with some necrotic areas in the left lacrimal gland. This was pleomorphic adenoma. Here we see enlargement of bilateral lacrimal glands, very homogeneous. This was a case of lymphoma. Pseudotumor, also known as idiopathic orbital inflammatory syndrome, is the second most common cause of exophthalmos. It is a non-granulomatous orbital inflammatory process. It is mostly unilateral. It causes pain and onset is sudden. It responds very well to steroids. It is important to note that majority of pseudotumor are unilateral. They are painful and they respond very well to steroids. They involve the tenderness insertions of the extraocular muscles and multiple structures of the orbit can be involved. In this case, there is some soft tissue infiltration in the preceptal space bilaterally. There is some thickening and enhancement of the sclera on the right side. And this is a different patient in which multiple extraocular muscles only on the left side were involved. The right sided extraocular muscles were normal. Many times only one or two extraocular muscles are involved by pseudotumor. Pseudotumor can also cause thickening and enhancement of the optic nerve sheet complex. Here we see some fat stranding and infiltration into the retrobulbar uh, fat and enlargement of bilateral lacrimal glands. Thyroid orbitopathy is the most common cause of exophthalmos in adults. It presents usually five years after the thyroid disease. It is an autoimmune process which is unrelated to thyroid function. Extraocular muscle enlargement uh, spares the tendinous insertions. In thyroid orbitopathy, the tendinous insertions are spared while in cases of gray, uh, while in cases of pseudotumor, the tendinous insertions are involved. Thyroid orbitopathy presents uh, involves both the orbits and multiple extraocular muscles are involved. Mnemonic is I am slow. So most commonly involved muscle is inferior rectus, then medial rectus, then superior rectus and lateral rectus. Sometimes enlargement of extraocular muscles can be very profound which can cause mass effect on the optic nerve and can cause decreased visual acuity and ischemia. Occasionally, surgery is performed to decompress to relieve the pressure from the optic nerves. Retinoblastoma is the most common intraocular malignant tumor in childhood. 90% of cases present before the age of 5 years. Majority of times, ophthalmologists are able to diagnose the retinoblastoma. <coughs> Main role of imaging is to look for extraocular extension. Sometimes these tumors will extend posteriorly along the optic nerve and they can extend intracranially. Rarely there could be a trilateral retinoblastoma in which we will see a mass lesion in the pineal area. This mass is causing hydrocephalus with transepidemal flow. Occasionally, a fourth mass is seen in the supracellular location which is called quadrilateral retinoblastoma. Calcification is seen in 90% of these patients and on MR, it will present as low signal intensity on T2 weighted images. These mass lesions show marked contrast enhancement, slight hyperintensity on T1 and low signal intensity on T2. 
retinoblastoma may be hereditary or sporadic. Here we see mass lesion in the left globe as well as a smaller mass in the right globe. This was because of metastasis from breast cancer. Breast cancer metastasis can involve the globe or other orbital structures. Metastasis in the orbits can also be seen from lung primary or prostate or from other primary malignancies. Melanoma may be primary or metastatic. It is commonly seen in sixth decade. 90% of melanomas they arise from choroid. 50% of the patients die of metastatic disease, usually to the liver, lungs, bones or skin. They present as hyperattenuating mass on CT scan. 80% of melanomas are melanotic, therefore they are going to be hyperintense on T1. Here we see a mass which is hyperintense on pre-contrast T1 weighted images because of melanotic melanoma and they are low signal intensity on T2. They can show restricted diffusion. We should look for extraocular extension either in the brain or in the orbits and we should look for metastasis. Sometimes uh, sinusitis can become complicated and can extend into the orbits. Here we see phlegmon and myositis because of complication of sinusitis. Occasionally we may see a frank subperiosteal abscess as a complication of sinusitis. Orbital venous varices are abnormal venous structures which enlarge after valsalva or prone position. So if you perform the scan with valsalva or prone position, they will get larger in size. But when you put the patient supine and after a few minutes or few, uh, few hours, they will significantly decrease in size. Many tumors can arise from adjacent paranasal sinuses, nasal cavities or bones which can extend into the orbit. So if we are looking at a tumor arising from nasal cavity, this tumor is extending into the right maxillary sinus as well as in the right orbit. This upstages the disease and we should describe. If we see a map, if we see opacification of paranasal sinuses only on one side, we should think about a polyp or a mass obstructing the osteometal unit causing retained secretions. <coughs> this mass was hypermetabolic uh, and also had a hypermetabolic metastatic lymph node at right level 2. It was because of squamous cell cancer in the nasal cavity. This mass presented with permeative destruction of the frontal bone on the right side along with an enhancing mass in the soft tissue extending intracranially, vasogenic edema, showed restricted diffusion which is bright on diffusion, low signal intensity on ADC, low signal intensity on T2, lobulated infiltrative irregular margins, permeative destruction of bone and this tumor extending inferiorly in the superior aspect of the orbit in the extraconal space causing some mass effect on the globe. We should also look for perineural tumor spread. In this patient, there was squamous cell cancer in the forehead uh, just above the orbit and there was perineural extension. This is the squamous cell carcinoma in the forehead and this is a perineural extension. There is thickening and enhancement of the supraorbital nerve and the tumor is extending till the level of the macular scape. Here we see expansion and sclerosis of the greater wing of sphenoid on the right side along with some soft tissue mass in the orbit near the apex. Whenever there is a mass near the apex, we should describe the location because it can cause compression and ischemia of the optic nerve. A mass lesion is also seen in the intracranial portion. There is abnormal enhancement of the greater wing of sphenoid. There is sclerosis and irregularity of the bone on the CT scan. Now prostate metastasis can also look like this occasionally or uh, sclerotic metastasis from breast. They can also look like this. Dermoid and epidermoid are congenital lesions and they gradually increase in size. If we see fat density, we should think about dermoid. So this is a dermoid with fat density in the extraconal space causing mass effect on the orbit. Here we see a retrobulbar dermoid which is fat density. Here we see an epidermoid which is fluid signal intensity causing expansion of the bone and extending into the extraconal space. Another small epidermoid on the lateral aspect of the orbit. To summarize, these are the main mass lesions which are commonly seen in the pediatric patients. Retinoblastoma is the most common tumor, commonly diagnosed by ophthalmologist. Our job is to look for retrobulbar extension along the optic nerve, look for trilateral or quadrilateral retinoblastoma. 90% of retinoblastomas calcify and you will see some calcification which is seen as low signal intensity on T2 weighted images.
Many of them will be bilateral, so also look in the other globe. Optic nerve glioma. The mass is not separately seen from the nerve. There is enlargement of the nerve and it can be unilateral or bilateral. If it is bilateral, then it is pathognomonic for NF1. Rhabdomyosarcoma is a very aggressive malignant tumor commonly seen in the extraconal space and it can cause rapid onset of proptosis. We should look for metastatic lesions elsewhere in the body. Metastasis from neuroblastoma and histiocytosis are also aggressive lesions and they can look like rhabdomyosarcoma. Venolymphatic malformation is usually extraconal but it can be multi-compartmental or intraconal. It is a cystic lesion which is very hyperintense on T2, shows multiple fluid levels and there is no enhancement. Majority of cases are seen below the age of 20 years. In adults, melanoma and metastasis, they commonly involve the globe. Melanoma can be primary or metastatic. It is hyperintense on pre-contrast even weighted images. Optic nerve glioma causes enlargement of the optic nerve itself, while optic nerve meningioma will spare the optic nerve and it will cause thickening and enhancement of the optic nerve sheet, giving rise to classic tram track or donut appearance. Venous vascular malformation, also known as hemangioma, is a slow flow vascular malformation which is seen in the intraconal space. It is hyperintense on T2, do not show early arterial phase enhancement, and there is delayed venous fill in. Extraocular muscles can be involved by pseudotumor or thyroid orbitopathy. Pseudotumor is usually unilateral, it is painful, responds very well to steroids, and there is involvement of the uh, tendinous insertion. Thyroid orbitopathy, it is usually bilateral, involves multiple extraocular muscles, mnemonic is I am slow, the inferior rectus is most commonly involved. Lacrimal gland mass lesions majority of times have overlapping imaging findings. They can be benign or malignant such as pleomorphic adenoma, a benign tumor, adenoid cystic carcinoma or mucoepidermoid carcinoma which are malignant tumors. Lymphoma is also common. Pseudotumor, sarcoidosis and Sjogren's disease can happen. Nerve sheet tumors such as schwannoma, they are usually seen in the extraconal space on T2 and contrast enhanced images, they appear heterogeneous. Sometimes mass lesions arising from the paranasal sinuses, orbits and adjacent bones can extend into the orbit. We should also look for perineural tumor spread. Some mass lesions are multi-compartmental such as metastasis, lymphoma and pseudotumor. But we should remember there is always some overlap and some exceptions when we, should, uh, when we look about the compartmental approach. Thank you.